Okay, sorry about that. I had to wrap up real quick. Let's finish up with the soft palate. So the soft palate uh, does extend to the edges of the tongue and the pharynx. So it's kind of an extension of, um, it, it's the junction, I guess you would say, uh, between the tongue and the pharynx going down the back of the throat to the esophagus. There's plenty of mucous membrane here and muscle. And this is where we have the, uh, I always say this in kind of a weird way, the palatoglossal arches, uh, because it helps me remember how to spell it. And then the palatopharyngeal arches as well. The, the, uh, the glossal arches, glossal always has to do with the tongue. And pharyngeal has to do obviously with the pharynx. So the tongue itself, the functions of the tongue is to help you uh, move food around inside of your mouth so that you can mechanically uh, tear food apart before you swallow it. So uh, the tongue allows you to compress the food, abrate to some degree, and then distort the food. Think of bubble gum, making bubbles with bubble gum, right? It allows you to swap, helps you to swallow the food by pushing the food back to the pharynx. And it does help you with uh, analyzing what you put in your mouth via touch. What's the texture of what you put in your mouth? Temperature, how hot or cold is it? And of course, our taste receptors, which are chemoreceptors. Remember that the flavors that we can taste are salty, right? Which is basically a detection of sodium chloride. Sweet. Sweet is interesting because really what you're tasting is sucrose, not glucose, although you can taste glucose as well. Um, salty, sweet, uh, sour. Sour would be acid like citric acid. So we have salty, sweet, sour, and um, bitter. And bitter is gonna be things like uh, tannins, things that could be uh, potentially poisonous. And then there's also the taste of like amino acid. So like the taste of meat. This is sometimes called umami. So basically what ends up happening is you can taste things through your sensory taste receptors. You also smell them, which we've talked about before. Um, but all of these molecules are going to mix with uh, the mucus, uh, saliva, and so forth. And some of them, say for example like sucrose, which is glucose bound to fructose. This is an F, fructose. Okay, um, The enzyme salivary amylase cuts the link between those two so that it liberates the individual glucose from the fructose. And it's actually uh, fructose that you really taste super sweet. There are two main regions of the tongue, the body and the root. The body is basically the part that you see when you stick out your tongue. Uh, and then the root is way deep at the base of the, of the uh, throat. Well, not at the base of the throat, but at the junction of the pharynx and the oral cavity. And so the dorsum is the superior surface, has lots and lots of papillae where the uh, taste receptors are located. And then the, do, uh, the root, like I said, is down near the pharyngeal opening. And so what the tongue is doing is there's an epithelium, a series of cells that secretes mucin or mucin and inguinal, linguinal lipase, not inguinal, linguinal, sorry. And this helps to digest fat or lipids. So we've already started with amylase, right? Amylase is digesting uh, carbohydrates. And now we have lipase, lingual lipase, which di digests fats. So this is the beginning of digestion in your mouth. The inferior epithelium of the tongue underneath is much thinner. Uh, and then you have the lingual uh, uh, frenulum, which connects the body to the floor of the mucosa. That's that little kind of line that you see when you uh, stick your tongue out. Tongue muscles, you have intrinsic and extrinsic muscles, and they're both controlled by the hypoglossal nerve, which is the 12th nerve. The intrinsic muscles help kind of perform the big movements of the tongue, but the intrinsic muscles allow you to alter the shape of your tongue so that you can uh, uh, produce speech. This is what allows you to do the t, p, s type sounds. Um, some intrinsic muscles are shaped slightly or oriented slightly different than some people, so this allows you to make those little curly Q shapes with your tongue, which is a genetic predisposition. I can't do it, but my daughter can actually make her tongue stick, kind of, instead of flat, she can make her tongue like a, a, a vertical line that's really kind of different. 
Another um, accessory organ for the digestive system are teeth. Now, teeth are very important for mastication or chewing. It helps us break down um, whatever we're eating. Uh, we'll talk about the names of the individual teeth, but the teeth are living organs in the mouth. When you look at the tooth in cross-section, superficially, you have basically the dentin, the white part of the teeth, that's the part that uh, can become degraded with bacteria if you have a, a cavity. I'm sorry, that's the, I'm sorry, enamel. The dentin is down deep. I don't know, I, would, I just looked at the word dentin first. The enamel is on top. The dentin is in the middle. The dentin is a fibrous material that uh, is kind of similar to bone, but dentin cannot be replaced as you go throughout your life. So once the dentin is damaged, the only way to repair it is using something like a, a filling material. And then you have the pulp, so here's our dentin. Then you have the pulp cavity right in here. This is where you have the vasculature and the blood supply that goes down into the roots of the teeth. So when somebody gets a root canal done, when there's an infection of the tooth, so let's say you had like um, bacteria that have degraded the enamel and the dentin getting all the way down into the root of the tooth, into the um, pulp cavity. The bacteria can get deep down into the pulp and eventually if the the cavity is bad enough they'll have to drill down and remove all of this material here and then they fill it up with a uh, filling material and so that is called the, this is actually called the root canal but when you have the procedure or root canal done what they're doing is they're removing all the vasculature the nerves and trying to fill in the the root canal itself so that the tooth does not become more damaged and um, infected. The gin gingival sulcus is the separation between the gingiva or the gum, okay? So the gingiva is the same thing as your gums, okay? And the tooth itself. Uh, cementin is, the, uh, is a molecule that, all these little dots here, that help, holds the tooth in place and then you uh, associated with, it becomes associated with the periodontal ligaments. The periodontal ligaments hold the teeth into the uh, cavity. Here's the apical foramen down here. The apical foramen for a tooth allows vasculature and nerves through. Uh, the bone of alveolus is basically the spongy bone that the tooth sit in, inside of, and then branches of alveolar vessels and the nerve. These are just the branches coming into the tooth right here. So teeth, again, are anchored into the socket or the alveolus via the periodontal ligaments associating with collagen fibers inside the tooth. Those fibers extend into the dentin and uh, basically make a real strong joining between the tooth and the bone. We call this uh, gamophosis, all right? So that, that's a, a particular type of a joint or an articulation. Cementin covers the root dentin providing protection and anchoring the periodontal ligament, like I mentioned before. And it's real similar to bone. So the gingiva, like I mentioned, is the, the gums, and the gingival sulcus is that tight attachment between the tooth and the, the gums itself. And, and for very healthy teeth and gums, you'll have a very, very tight uh, connection between the two. Basically, it keeps bacteria from going underneath the gingiva. So the gingival sulcus helps keep bacteria out, okay? And if that breaks down, you end up getting a bacterial infection of the gums or the gingiva, and that is called gingivitis, which is not comfortable. So when we're looking at the teeth, here's our uh, tooth cro uh, cross-section view. Uh, all humans have a number of, of teeth. It's different for adults and children. Children have more teeth than adults because they're emerging. So let's first start with the names of the teeth over here. We have uh, first our upper jaw and our lower jaw. We have incisors, oops, over here, incisors. The cuspids are our canines. The canines right here and here, the upper and lower canines or cuspids, are intended to help uh, tear and rip uh, food. The bicusp, the incisors are cutters, okay? So they're kind of flat teeth that allow you to cut into or slice whereas the cuspids rip. The bicuspids have two little uh, ridges, hence bi, and then cuspids. These are your premolars, and they're important for kind of ripping, but also for chewing, and then your molars are important 
for grinding. So when we look over here in C, looking at adult teeth, you'll see that you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 teeth, all right, uh, across the top. Um, each one of these teeth come in at different times. So like uh, the, the central incisors, permanent incisors, you'll get at about seven to eight years old and so forth. You can review these on your own. And in physiology, we only briefly talk about tooth development. Uh, so hopefully you'll be hearing more about that in physiology. So the types of teeth, uh, um, you have the milk teeth in early, early development, baby teeth. You have 20 of those. Uh, deciduous dentition. And so you'll have basically 25 on each side. The permanent dentition are your adult teeth. On the upper jaw, of course, you have your incisors, uh, cuspids, bicuspids, and molars. The same number on the lower jaw, so that gives you a total of 32 teeth. Remember, I, I counted uh, 16 on top. So the dental frame uh, frame of reference has to do with how they count the number of teeth across the top and bottom. So the dental frame of reference starts with upper and lower rows curving in the dental arcade, which starts go like this. Here's the dental arcade, all right. Labial and buccal, or buccal, some people call it buccal. Um, labial uh, would be uh, more closely associated with the lips, and buccal or buccal is closer um, uh, it, here it is, lips and cheeks. And then the palatal or uh, upper or lingual refers to the inner surface uh, closer to the, to the arch. So out here on the sides here, this is labial or buccal, okay? And inside here, the edges of the teeth on the inside here, that is palatal because it's close to your palate or your tongue. The occlusal surfaces are the points that make contact. So the occlusal surfaces are going to actually be doing the clipping or the tearing or the crushing or the grinding. So that's literally the surfaces of the teeth that are doing the work. So over here for the incisors, the occlusal, the occlusal surface would be the actual clipping edges. <clears throat> so the pharynx is, we've talked about the uh, nasopharynx before, the oropharynx and the laryngeal pharynx all doing different jobs, but the pharynx is literally the back of the throat. It's a common pathway for, for air, starting with the nasopharynx, food and liquids, which would be the oral pharynx, and then of course the laryngeal pharynx, which, would, which helps us uh, resonate and make uh, vocal sounds. Um, basically, it is our shared digestive and respiratory pathway, and it extends from the internal nares, which is right over here, Okay, here's the external nares right there. Draw an arrow there. And it is, extends down through the trachea and the esophagus right here. The trachea is in front, the esophagus is in the back. And the pharynx has its three regions, the naso, oro, and laryngeal pharynx. So swallowing, how does that happen? There are three phases, the buccal or buccal phase, which is where you put food in your mouth, it gets compressed against the hard palate. You don't even notice this sometimes, but you press food up. The tongue forces the bolus of food back into the pharynx, and the, uh, as that happens, the soft palate raises, keeping food from going up into the nasopharynx. It keeps it into the oral pharynx. So let me go back one slide. Oh, actually, let's do this. So food goes in, okay? The buccal phase where food goes in, here's the food. And the soft palate makes contact with the uh, um, oral pharynx and the very end part of the nasal pharynx, making sure that food goes down and not up, all right? And then you have, in addition to that, uh, a, an adjustment. Well, let's go next to the pharyngeal phase. The bolus uh, then goes back into, uh, past the up, uh, by the epiglottal folds, covering the larynx, and the bolus enters the esophagus. So right here, here's the pharyngeal phase where the food basically uh, comes into contact with the primary part of the esophagus and the uh, trachea is closed off via the epiglottis. You could see that there. The esophageal phase is where we start feeling the peristalsis and the swallowing. 
So the food starts sliding down the esophagus and smooth muscles.